Hey, fellow SweetScript developers, I am Eric, your SweetScript coach, and this is another SweetScript teardown. Um, so we have some viewer slash reader submitted code, and I am basically going to be going through it, reviewing it, um, and kind of refactoring it a little bit with the main goal of making it a little more readable and uh, concise. But before we get into that, if you would like to become a more competent and confident SweetScript developer yourself, then you can get started today with my free email course on the best resources for learning SweetScript all on your own. Uh, you will find a link for that at the top of the video description. Okay, with that, let's get started. All right, on the left-hand side here, we have a script submitted by a viewer just like you who was brave and courageous enough to uh, put their code center stage. Um, so my goal is to look at this uh, like a script that I have maybe inherited. Um, maybe I um, just started a new project, whether I'm a contractor or an employee, uh, I just started a new project, um, or I just started on a new team or with a new company or whatever it might be. I just uh, got handed a new project that has a bunch of existing code. And my first task is somewhere in this code. Uh, something in this MapReduce script is either going wrong or we're adding a new feature to it. It needs to do something differently, whatever it might be. The requirements have changed or there's a problem, whatever that might be. So, but I'm coming into this brand new with fresh eyes. Um, so how do I go about um, going through this and figuring out what it does and refactoring it, um, et cetera? So we're actually going to do this in a couple passes. It's probably going to take a few. It's probably going to take several videos, actually. I don't want uh, a six-hour video or anything like that. Um, so my goal with this is not to, we're not going to go fix all the bugs. Um, I don't know enough about the business process. We're not going to deploy this in a NetSuite account and test it. That's not the point. We're not going to fix all the bugs. Certainly, if there's something glaring or, or obvious, yes, we will fix that and point that out. But that is not the goal. It is also not the goal to come up with perfectly optimized, fastest possible code. That is not the point either. That should be the very, very, very last thing that you ever do with a script. The first thing you need to do with a script is make it work. If it doesn't work, you have nothing. The second thing should be to make it readable, uh, almost like natural language. Uh, very easily digested, easily understood, easily followed. Then after that point, then you can start getting super creative with performance optimization and things like that. Um, but the two most important things to do with any script are to, one, make sure it works, then two, make sure it is readable. So those two are going to be our goals. Uh, I, I'm assuming that step one has been completed. I am assuming that this works already. Um, so the focus of this video, or more accurately, probably series of videos, will be to make this uh, very readable, very easily understood. So we're going to refactor this MapReduce to make it hopefully almost read like natural language for the most part. And we're going to break it down and refactor it so that we can do that. First, we need to know what this does. Now, to be fair, I cheated a little bit. Uh, you can probably tell by the file names, I kind of know what this does already. However, I am still going to go through this like I've never seen it before. Um, it should still be a pretty fair representation of how someone is going to go about reading your code or how you are going to go about reading your own code six months from now. Um, so this is just as much to help your future self as it is to help your teammates or new employees or uh, whatever, other contractors, who knows. Whoever's going to touch your code next, which will very often be your future self, uh, this is to help them. So let's go through this and see if we can't figure out what this does. 
Um, the first thing I see is that we are importing a whole bunch of modules, uh, and they're all NetSuite modules. So we're not worried about other libraries or other modules or other you know custom files. This is all NetSuite code, uh, so that's nice. We don't everything we everything we need is right here in this this file this script. Um, right away, what I see without even going into what they do, handle error, handle error, handle error. Uh, okay, so the first thing we see is a bunch of error handling. Um, I don't like that, honestly. Uh, that's not my uh, style. What I like to see, the very first thing I like to see in a script, are the entry points. Where is NetSuite going to enter this script? Uh, when this script gets triggered, what, what happens right away? I don't want to have to scroll down and hunt for the entry points. Um, so that's the first thing I'm actually going to do. I'm going to go through here. Uh, here's our get input data. Uh, there's map. There's reduce. Uh, there's summarize. Here's our four entry points. So I'm just going to right away. This is the first thing I'm going to do. Actually, you know what? I'm not going to do this over here. So the left side is the original. The right side is my code, uh, my refactored version, how I might go about this. And again, we'll take multiple passes at this. We're going to take multiple iterations and continually improve on this. So I'm going to cut all the entry points, and those are going to be the first thing I see in this module. Cool. OK, one thing that I can already see the indentation is off. It's too deep, and there's that bothers me. It's a style thing. This is not necessary, but I'm going to do it anyway. OK. That satisfies uh, some of my obsessions. OK, indentation fixed for now. OK. I do this a lot when we get really long lists of uh, imports. I spread them out, uh, the, the import module names themselves onto one file. Um, or, I'm sorry, well, not one file, onto each, each one gets its own line. Uh, so that I can very clearly see what modules we're importing without uh, running off the page or something like that. Okay. Some bracket inconsistencies. Um, here it's on the same line, here it's on the next line. Okay, this will be a fun detour um, to get started. So this is a problem. There is, there is actually a problem with this. Well, not quite with this. However, this is important to know. Um, most style guides, uh, and if you're working on a team, you should do things like this, like brace placement for instance, should always be the same. Um, whether you like them on the same line or the next line, I don't care, it doesn't matter. But be consistent about it. Um, there is a good reason in JavaScript to put them on the same line. And that reason is JavaScript's uh, automatic semicolon insertion. So let's um, show an example. Um, okay, so very simple function, takes in two numbers, returns an object that contains the sum and the difference of those two objects. Great, so we can call it 5, 3, returns us a nice object. Awesome, great, that works. Notice I put all my braces on the same line. Okay, fine, what if you like them on the, the next line? Oops. Cool, fine, if that's your style, great. Or maybe not great. Uh, that's a syntax error. Why is that a syntax error? Um, okay, well, moving the braces. So what if I move this, let's see, what if I move this one, oops, this one back? Still a syntax error. Um, okay, maybe it was the other one. Yeah, okay, that's fine. So it was this one. So um, for some reason, this right here, putting the brace on a new line after a return is an error. Why? Well, 
that is because net or not NetSuite, not NetSuite. This is JavaScript in general. Nothing to do with NetSuite. What it does is automatically inserts semicolons at the end of programming statements. So for instance, this semicolon right here is not mandatory. I don't have to put it there. JavaScript will automatically do it for me as it interprets the code. Great, that sounds nice. Um, except that when the interpreter gets to this return statement, return is a complete JavaScript statement all on its own. That is a full, fully qualified command. So the JavaScript interpreter sees that and says, oh, you forgot your semicolon. I'm gonna be helpful and put it there for you. So it does that, which cuts off our object from the rest of the code and now makes this a syntax error because we're just declaring like a, a block of code and that's not valid. So do math. Sometimes you won't even get this syntax error. Uh, sometimes this code will try to run and do math will just always return undefined. And when it looks like this, that bug is gonna be super hard to track down if you don't know what's going on. So, uh, lesson of the day, always put your braces on the same line in JavaScript. Return is not the only thing that will do that. Any complete statement that you split across multiple lines like this will get interrupted by JavaScript's very helpful Auto, automatic semicolon insertion. If you're curious, just search JavaScript automatic semicolon insertion. You will get all kinds of opinions and articles and lots of reading to do. Um, I just choose not to deal with it and I always put my braces on the same line. And I, as you can see, put all my semicolons in. I don't let the interpreter do it for me. I put them in there. Don't leave them out. Back to the task at hand. All right, our get input data, what do we do? So this is the first thing that happens in a MapReduce. We come in and we get the current script and read a parameter off of it. Um, it is apparently an integer that um, represents which file we're processing. It's file to process, okay. Um, Another little nitpick style thing. Uh, don't put your comments after the statement. Uh, in a place like this, it's fine. Uh, it's very easy to see. However, as we get, as our code lines get longer and longer, I'm not going to go through and fix all of these. But as our code line get codes, code lines, wow, get longer and longer. It gets harder and harder to read a comment at the end of the line. So you can see it as we get down here, all of these comments start getting cut off and now I have to like scroll over and figure it out. Don't do that. Or like this one out here. That is completely cut off. If I'm just kind of scrolling down and perusing this like I am, as I'm getting used to and familiar with this script, I don't even know there's a comment here. I would have to scroll all the way over. Uh, and it's very common that you're looking at multiple files at once. That's not unusual. Or that maybe you have, uh, I don't know, say NetSuite up on this half and your code on this half. That's not uncommon. Uh, so I would recommend putting comments above the code that they comment, that they annotate rather than at the end. Okay, that is, again, I digress. Obviously that has no bearing on the functionality of the script. So we read uh, a script parameter, that is an integer, I suppose. Then we load a save search with this hard-coded ID. Um, this is always a big red flag to me. When I see this, that's an immediate opportunity to refactor um, internal IDs like this are liable to change, um, not within the same account. Internal IDs within the same account are tend to be fixed and will not change. However, let's say you are working in a sandbox. Uh, you're developing your code in a sandbox and then moving it to a production account. These IDs will be different. Or if this is a sweet app 
obviously your customers will have wildly different internal IDs for uh, your various searches. So when I see a hard-coded ID like this, that is an immediate um, opportunity to refactor that at least into maybe a, a variable, like a constant uh, module level variable. So we could do that instead. In this case, uh, with a MapReduce, I would go even one step further. Um, but we'll get to that. Right now, we just, all we're trying to do right now is get familiar with what this is doing. We'll come back. We're going to, like I said, we're going to do this in multiple passes. So we're going to go all the way through this to see if we can figure out what it's doing and then circle back and start improving things. Okay. So we're doing a, a search of files, I guess. This is a save search of, of files in the file cabinet. We are only returning the first eight results. Um, so it looks like, okay, so we are based on this comment here and this note here, which good job documenting that and these questions and stuff. Um, we're returning the first eight files. Uh, we are deploying this script apparently eight times. So it looks like each script, each script deployment is going to run, going to process a separate file. Okay. Um, I, again, I don't know enough about the actual business process behind this, how these files are made or generated or received or whatever it might be to, to necessarily uh, refute that design approach. I am a little worried based on this comment or this question. Oops. Are paged, re paged results able to be passed through to the map stage and exceed the 1,000 result limit? Yes, they are. So if we are breaking up our data into multiple files to circumvent this limit, then in that case, we, have, we, we haven't done anything wrong uh, as long as this works, uh, but there's a better way to do that. Uh, and again, we'll talk about that as we refactor this. Um, so we are uh, going and finding, um, so we, we do a search and we get eight files back. And then um, based on line of file search was our parameter. Okay, so the parameter is the index of the search result um, that holds the file we're supposed to process. Okay, that um, I suppose works, but it took me probably 10 minutes to figure that out. Um, so there's definitely some opportunities for improvement there. Great though, we get the internal ID of the file, we load it, I'm sorry, we load it out of the file cabinet, we read its contents, uh, we, what does this do? Okay, uh, we have a generic utility, looks like, for reading, for just a generic algorithm for reading and parsing a CSV. Cool, it looks like we've ripped it off of Stack, Stack Overflow. That's fine, that happens. Um, great job putting the link in here. Um, whenever you do that, whenever you pull code from somewhere else, whether it's Stack Overflow or a library or a friend, uh, one, give credit where credit is due. Uh, after you check the license, uh, make sure whatever you're trying to use like this is open source. Um, give credit where credit is due. And again, help your future self out by, oh, where did I find this? Uh, right here, right there. So wherever you kind of found stuff like this code you didn't write yourself, uh, it's always good to put a reference in there for multiple reasons. Uh, but okay, we're not gonna nitpick that. I'm gonna assume this works. Uh, we didn't write that ourselves. Um, so I'm just going to assume it works and skip over it. So, but that's what we're doing. We're parsing out CSV data, as you may have inferred from the title. And then we are slicing it up into chunks. Um, we're splitting off. Um, this is the, so we're, we're cutting off the end. Um, either 
basically, if it's any longer than uh, this, 500 rows, then we're going to cut it off. So that's the maximum uh, row. We will process at most 500 rows. Okay, that's fine. Um, I think I would probably rename this then, and we'll come back to that. So we're cutting this, and we're splicing off the first 500 elements uh, 500 rows from the CSV, and we'll be processing those. Great. And we're going to iterate over that data. I am concerned already by uh, the loop label. That is very seldom necessary. Um, okay, so we're going to loop through. We're going to grab the current Mac. So we get, we get the row, then we get the first cell from that row, and we call it current Mac. Uh, if it's empty, we just skip. Um, okay, do we use this anywhere else? CSV row loop. No. All right. So I'm just going to get rid of that. Um, loop labels are very seldom necessary. Continue does the same thing. There's no need for the label there. All right, continue will advance the current loop. There's no containing loop here or anything like that. So we can just fix our indentation and just continue on and just skip. So if the uh, first cell of the row is blank, we just skip. We just skip right on. We put that first cell value through some processing. Um, we'll come back to this. Looks like we're just doing some regular expression. Split, join, split, join, split, join. Okay, well, there's definitely some repeated code here. We'll figure that out. Um, usually a split join can be reduced down to just a, a filter. We're just removing characters, it looks like. We'll come back to that. That's what it's doing. It is processing the string, formatting it into a usable format. Great. I might call that format Mac instead, perhaps. Um, so we retrieve the first cell, we put it through some processing. Now we start making a search. So we set up some columns. Uh, this is a very verbose way of defining search columns. So we'll come back to how to make that shorter. Uh, we're searching some custom records, some Mac IDs, custom record Mac IDs. Okay. Then for our results, we grab the internal ID. If the owner is empty. Okay, so here, right? I'm trying to like parse through the code and there's a comment right here that would help a lot. Great. Let's put that there instead. If the owner is empty or null, then just add the internal ID to the end of the array. That's what we do here. Okay, so we we are building up, we're, we're translating our search results into this hold array. We're moving them to a new array. From the back, we're filling from the back, at least when the owner is empty. And instead of putting the search result in there, we are making a new array of the MAC address. So, okay, so. Um, as we build this out, this is what we're getting. We're making a whole, hold array starts out empty. Then we get uh, a MAC address. Okay, I think, I think MAC address. Um, all right, well, we get some value. We get that. So that's the first cell. That would be current Mac. Then a, we put a comma on it. Oh, I'm sorry. No, wait, first. Okay, first. We make an array inside of an array. Then whatever current Mac is, some string value, uh, we append a comma, and then the internal ID. 
So it's going to be something like that. And we're just going to keep doing that for every, every uh, row of the CSV file. So that's going to keep going on. Um, like, you know, change up. Like so. Hopefully there's no terrible, horrible words in there or something. Um, and that's going to keep going, just like that. So that's what we're building. We're building this array of arrays of strings. Uh, very questionable data structure at this point. But again, we're just trying to figure out what this does. And we'll come back to that. Um, so that's what this branch does. This branch, when the owner is uh, this specific person... So when the owner is a specific ID, internal ID of 12, we instead, again, the comment is at the end, so it's kind of cut off. And So instead of putting it at the back, like we do here, we use unshift to put the new element at the front. All right. And then... Otherwise, this is the same as this. Okay, so these do this, the, the if and the else do the same thing. This is the only thing that's really different. Uh, when there's a specific owner, we put that at the front. Otherwise, we put it at the end. Okay. Interesting. Uh, the return true just helps the each keep going. So there's no conditions where we would stop processing. We would, we're always, we're going to take all of our search results always and turn them into something like this. Okay. And then we do another search. Um, isn't this... Oh, right here. So I'm having to like scroll back and forth to, to compare the difference. That's already not fun. Um, we're using the same columns. The columns don't change. It looks like only the filter changes and it only changes very slightly. Uh, this one is just looking to where we start with the current Mac and this one where we start with an equal sign, a quote symbol, and then the current Mac. So there must be some artifacts maybe introduced by whatever process is, you know, sending us these files or something in the format of these files is, is adding a prefix to some of these current Mac values. Uh, so we need to filter by both. So, okay. Um, there's probably a way to combine these into one search rather than doing two separate ones. Um, I say that like I don't know. There is a way to, to make to combine these, and we'll do that later. Um, this okay. We process these results, and this looks very familiar. Um, when the owner is empty, we add to the end. Same format, right? Mac comma internal ID. Okay, add to the end. When the owner is twelve, add to the beginning with unshift. Otherwise, add to the end. Okay, so this is identical. Identical to this. So immediately, immediately, that should be a red flag for everyone, right? Whenever we see repeated or duplicated code, that's almost always a great, a great candidate to put into a separate function. Um, and then reuse the function rather than copying and pasting the code. Um, another good indicator is these, when you find yourself doing these comment blocks where, hey, here's what this section of code does and here's what that section of code does. Those sections are in themselves great candidates to be separated out into their own functions. Um, but again, we'll come back to doing that sort of thing. So basically we build up hold array. Um, we iterate over, once we're done doing that, and copying the search results into hold array in this different format. We then copy hold array into final array. Yeah. Filling from the end. 
Okay, and then we reset hold array and do it again. Okay. So eventually, so so we do the first search. So we put all the first search results into a hold array. Um, then we put all the second set of results into hold array, and then we copy them all into final array. So we're taking two different search result sets and putting them into final array, and that becomes our output for get input data. Uh, in the middle here, uh, once again, here's a magic number, but we are, looks like we are moving the CSV file that we got back way up here. That's what that is, right? So having to scroll back up 150 lines to uh, 200 lines almost to figure out what this was, not ideal. Um, but I think that's the file. And we're just moving it into a new folder. So we have a folder that represents the completed files we've processed. Great, cool. Um, again, I'd probably move this, we'll probably move this into a variable um, or even a script parameter later. Uh, but whenever I see magic numbers like this, uh, that's an immediate candidate for refactor. Um, and I'm not making up magic numbers, that is a computer science-y term, magic numbers, magic strings are hard-coded values like this that are liable to change and break your code. So we'll show some strategies for dealing with those. Um, okay, then we log, we output. Okay, so that's our get input data. We process a CSV file. We use a CSV file to drive some search filters. Then we package up the search results as an array of arrays of a string and send those to map. Okay. Map goes through um, parses, parse string of, okay. Um, not sure why we're parsing then string, restringifying. Uh, well, maybe this comment will tell me. Maybe I should read, huh? Um, the parse removes most of the punctuation. Mm. Yes, yeah. So when you pass data from phase to phase, uh, NetSuite has to serialize them. We can't um, pass raw JavaScript objects over the wire. Um, that's not how the internet or computers work. Uh, we have to package them up into serializable data structures like strings. So it takes your whole um, JavaScript object, your array, whatever it is, stringifies it, and then that's what we, so we received the string here and we have to parse it back out. What I'm not sure is why we restringify it after that. The stringify removes the object punctuation inside of the array. Well, if we don't, so if we, if we don't want them to be arrays, we shouldn't have packaged them as arrays, right? Um, Okay, so there's probably an opportunity here to refactor how we are packaging up our search results in the first place so that we don't have to do all of this stuff. Um, so this code here is just to get all of the data out of the context. Yeah, right here we're removing, we're doing our split joins again to remove certain things. Okay, so we're doing some data scrubbing, basically. That's okay. Um, we'll look at that again. And then what we're doing is basically we end up grouping internal IDs by MAC addresses. I think this is the first full mention of MAC address. Um, maybe you could infer it from some of the variable names, but here on line 235 is the first time we mention MAC address. So now, at line 235, I know this script does something with MAC addresses. So we are grouping internal IDs of those custom records we were searching before by their MAC address. Awesome, that's the map phases job. Okay. Shuffle happens here, yes. So um, the shuffle phase is just a, an internal MapReduce phase where the developer doesn't have to worry about it. You don't write any code. NetSuite 
that's how NetSuite is is doing the parallel processing in your MapReduce. So it's the shuffle phase basically takes the results, the data from the previous phase, and assigns it to an appropriate queue um, or thread based on how many threads you've allowed this script deployment to occupy. And that's where your parallel processing comes from in your MapReduce. Um, okay, so yes, shuffle happens. Shuffle actually happens here too after get input data and after map. Um, okay, that's fine. So we move on to our reduce. So uh, reduce is going to receive a key. The key is a MAC address and the values is a list of internal IDs. Perfect. Uh, taking action means we mark duplicates as inactive while copying the value to the master record as long as the master record has no value. Okay, so right here, I think, on line 255, I have finally figured out that this script is deduplicating MAC addresses. And looking at my recording timer, that took me 40 minutes to uncover. Um, I've been doing this for six years, and it still took me that long to kind of get through this script and, and, and figure it out. So you can imagine, you know, either yourself coming back in a year to update this script or a, a junior developer. You're going to spend a bunch of time spinning your wheels, like trying to to get your head back into what the script does and how it does it. There is a lot of cognitive overhead in this. Like it takes a lot of mental effort to, to parse and process this file in your head and put together what it's doing. So that's our main goal is to factor that out um, and write the code in a way that, that we significantly lower that cognitive load. Um, so this, um, we load the master record, which is from the key. And then we loop through and load each of the potential duplicates. We, uh, we'll kind of revisit this so that we compare field values and basically, um, whatever is on the master record takes precedence. If there's no value on the master, then we copy the duplicate value into that field. Then we mark the duplicate as inactive and save it and add a memo and save it. Okay, and then we save the master record. And then in our summarize phase, so the, the reduce phase is, as usual, as it should be, the guts of our logic here, the real business logic that we're performing. We are deduplicating these, these custom records based on their the MAC address. Great. Uh, our summarize phase handles errors and creates summary records. Um, the summary record just kind of tracks some statistics. Great, so we have uh, successfully parsed through kind of what this does, but you can see how long that took. So what we wanna do is establish patterns for ourselves um, and styles of writing code that significantly reduce that, that cognitive load, that onboarding time, that ramp up time of familiarizing yourself with a script. Um, and it makes it easier when you come back later to maintain the script as well. So it's not just a, not just something for other people or um, it is a practical thing to do to save yourself time and much frustration later. But as I said, it's been almost 40 minutes, so I'm sure this will be... Uh, Pretty lengthy video. I'm gonna put a cut in here and we will come back uh, with the next video to start refactoring this. I think we will, I'm not sure yet. We'll see how I want to attack this.